Hello. <clears throat> Welcome to That Was the Week That Was. This is Sandy Shellis, and I'm really glad to have you guys here with me. I'll give you a couple of seconds, and uh, we're going to go over some things today. And I'm going to start, of course, with Donald Trump and the Putin summit in Helsinki. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I'm going to read one article that has something to do with it, my attitude about it, because I'll tell you, I have my feet my toes. I have myself in a couple of different worlds. And I see what is said everywhere on, on, on both sides. And I'm a progressive. I understand the viewpoint of anti-war. I understand the viewpoint of not wanting nukes. I understand all of it. But when it comes down to it for me, it's not about the hacking. It's not about the drilling. It, it, it is about the drilling. It's not about the election. It's not about anything. It is about the drilling, the Arctic, and I made some notes for myself today, and the ties between Trump and Putin in relationship to the fossil fuel industry. And I, I saw the comments when Trump called Russia a competitor. Why did he do that? He wants him to be a competitor so that we can continue to do the slaughter of the environment. Russia sent an icebreaker, a, a ship, sorry, I'm just worked up, a ship through an oil tanker without an icebreaker this year in the Arctic. The Arctic is melting. We are losing ice exponentially. That is not good news for the planet. And these two fools want to go off and keep doing and drilling. The Arctic has billions of tons of oil and gas in it. And Russia is not the only country. Canada, Norway, there's other countries that have access to the Arctic. But in, in, in Russia, in 2014, they amped their military presence in the north. And what I want to say out of this summit for me and probably others that might have figured it out is that the Arctic is under siege. The Arctic is being hacked. That's what's being hacked. The Arctic is being hacked and it's going to be hacked worse. All of our natural resources are being hacked. Okay. So I found an article in Grist that I put up on the page because we are talking about this week. And I'm going to read it and I'm going to do some commentary on it because I have been on everything. I have watched progressives reeling against people that are hysterical about the Trump and Putin visit. And I have watched other, you know, the, the other, other people that are, you know, screaming treason. I've watched it all. I got really upset. But of course, you know, my nobody understands my upset because nobody really cares and nobody understands the viewpoint that I have. A few of you, a few of you. But I'm going to go into this because Eric Holthouse does. And he is a meteorologist and a staff writer at Grist. And he covers climate science. So here we go. Whether Russia meddled in the U.S. presidential election in 2016 is not up for serious debate. Numerous intelligence agencies, both foreign and domestic, concluded it did. Okay. During a joint press conference with President Donald Trump in Helsinki on Monday, Russian President Vladimir Putin went a long way towards answering why. I did, he says, want Trump to win because he talked about bringing U.S. relationship with Russia back together. Okay. All right. So there we go. He wanted him to win. A lot of people wanted him to win. They voted for him. The statement was widely covered, but I'm convinced something else Putin said during that press conference is more important. I think there was a major oil and gas power. We as a major oil and gas power, and the United States as a major oil and gas power, this is Putin talking. As well, we could work together on regulation of international markets, he said. We do have space for cooperation here. Hence, Trump's comment about being competitors. They're going to compete more. OPEC is drying up. The biggest market in Russia is fossil fuels. 
and the United States is becoming fossil fuel central. Whoever does not understand that, wake up. That is my beef. And that is why I didn't want to, you know, the fact that there was nobody there, that's what really tipped me off and pissed me off. Because if there was somebody there, then they would have to be accountable to us about just what the hell they want to do. And, and we're talking, I want to do by raping and plunging and drilling and fracking the earth and the Arctic. So some close observers have drawn this connection before. There is no way to understand Trump's relationship with Russia without putting oil and climate politics at its center. If you're upset at Trump and Putin for undermining our democracy, just wait until you find out they, that they are likely colluding to destroy our planet's climate system too. This is what I'm shouting and screaming about, people. Share this. After Monday's meeting in Helsinki, it's clearer than ever that we are at a critical moment in our American democracy, as well as in the biggest and most important fight we've ever had, the fight against climate change. Fossil fuels still power 80% of the world's economy. Um, He's got a lot of stuff. He says, oh, and the leaders of that dying industry need to accept that oil is a dying industry. They have to accept it. And to stave off its decline, you can see why rapidly el eliminating dirty energy sources, exactly what scientists say we have to do, might be fiercely opposed by politicians who have a substantial stake in their success. And that's not just American politicians, that's politicians all over the world. And Vladimir Putin. Russia is a petrostate. And the US is now too. In fact, the two countries, as I was saying before I jumped ahead, the two countries are the world's largest non-OPEC oil producers extracting nearly as much as all OPEC countries. They also own an even greater share of the global natural gas market. Added together, the two countries produce six times more natural gas than the rest of the world. By working together, they can keep the global economy swimming in gas and oil to never get out of it, guys. And what's the primary force working against the fossil fuel industry these days? Climate activists. It's not difficult to see the Trump-Putin alliance as a deliberate attempt to delay action on climate change. Consider these moves. Trump's promise to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord was specifically designed to weaken it. And it was weak already. We're not going to achieve those uh, points in, in our uh, CO2 or the parts per million in the air of carbon. We're already going. We're, go we're already going up there. We're going to hit two degrees, said, I'd say, I don't know when. I'm not one of those scientists that can do that. But Trump's promise, so, it, so um, let's see, non-cooperation threatens climate finance under the Paris Agreement. Um, he also says, so it weakens the agreement and the spirit of cooperation it helped embody. That was the thing about the, the Paris thing. It was a spirit of cooperation so people could... Um, you know, maybe feel a little better, even if we're we're not going in a good direction, even if our Arctic is melting, even if we're having climate events and weather events that are hideously horrible, even if the oceans are dying, even if rainstorms are not just rain anymore, they're always torrential in so many parts of the world. Trump's move to open up offshore drilling in the Arctic will both help the US and Russia access to oil rich and increasingly ice free region. They want it to go ice free. They don't give a shit. Trump's steel tariffs on Europe will help bolster Russia's pipeline building and oil 
and gas industry. Bingo. Trump's claims that um, by purchasing natural gas, Germany was being controlled by Russia is a window into his vision of fossil fuel driven geopolitics. Trump's buddying with North Korea might even be designed to clear the way for a Russia gas pipeline there. So there's so much more to this than the hack and whatever else. This is our light, our planet, our Earth. From their comments leading up to Monday's meeting, it's clear that Trump and Putin see the oil and gas industry as a critical component to their working relationship. But here's the thing, and this is what Eric says, they will lose. Oh, I think I'm pixelated, woman. Let me show you the picture. My internet sucks. Pixelated woman. That picture was a Russian tanker. And if I don't know if you saw the sign on it without me. More to the story of besides just Russian meddling and hacking. Tell me, guys, am I pixelated? Because I, I can see that it looks like when I come back that it is pretty bad connection. Um, again, living rurally, and I, I'm going to lose viewers. But I want to go into one more thing. So, because I want to finish that up, you know, I, I, I respect a lot of different positions on that whole thing. But now, you know, I wanted to make clear where we come from over here at ECH, where it is so important to understand that it's not just an issue of hacking or Clinton or Trump, you know, at all. It is so much bigger than that. Can you guys tell me how bad the connection is? <laughs> all right. The next article I'm going to go to. It's going to be a long one. I don't know if I'm going to be able to go through this whole thing, especially when my uh, connection is so bad. The guy's name is Charles Eisenstein, and this article came in, and we put it on the page, and this article came in. He's an author and a speaker, and on his website, and I'm going to put all these links up, uh, Ecology, Earth, and Healing, Political and Social, Science and Philosophy, Alternative narr Narratives, Self and Psyche. So he's, he's, a, he's very talented. And I just discovered him because somebody sent it to me and I'm really happy. Okay. So we take down the Russian tanker so that we take my anger and pissed offness away. And I made myself pretty damn clear about 
my thoughts about, and a lot of other people's thoughts about what the hell is going on. And it's always the fossil fuel game because that's what's behind everything. It is what drives everything. You can't even make weapons without the fossil fuel industry. So how the hell could America sell weapons? How could Russia make their weapons? I don't even, if I, I could even, I could go into the whole denuclearizing thing, but you know what? That's for somebody else and for another show. This article is called Why I'm Afraid of Global Cooling, and it's a really nice article, but it's very long. And I don't know if you guys want me to go for that long, but I'm going to start this. And then if you like it, you can pick up on it. I mean, I really love to read the whole thing, but... I know that, you know, I've been on 20 minutes, but let's see. Let's go for it. Heath, why I'm afraid of global cooling. In the run-up to the publication of my next book, I've been monitoring sources across the spectrum of opinion on climate change. The other day I happened upon this piece, which describes recent measurements of ice mass and ice extent gains in the Arctic, Antarctic, Greenland, along with cool surface and tropospheric temperatures my heart sank. This is what I've been worried about for several years now as I've seen cracks spread in the global warming consensus. Before I explain why I'm worried about cooling, let me offer an opposite article from Nature stating that Antarctica is losing ice mass faster than ever and another article predicting 10 degrees Celsius warming by 2021. For more dissonance, read the, and he has a couple of links. Par, uh, partisans of each side shall no doubt hasten to explain to me how I've been duped by the other. Sounds like the Trump Russia thing, huh? <laughs> but my purpose here is not to establish the correctness of one viewpoint over another. Instead, I intend to illuminate something that gets lost in what has become a highly polarized and politicized debate. Here we go. Why on earth would I be concerned about global cooling? Given the dangers of global warming, one would think the signs of cooling trend of the cooling trend would be to welcome news. Whew. Ecological catastrophe averted. Now we can go back to business as normal. This is precisely my concern. Business as normal is ruining the planet, regardless of whether the climate is warming or cooling. Here are some of the changes that have happened just in my lifetime. And he was born in 1967. Okay, I don't know where I'm looking when I'm looking half the time. Fish biomass has decreased by more than half. The number of monarch butterflies has dropped by 90%. Deserts have expanded on every continent. Coral reef extent has declined by half. Mangroves in Asia have declined 80%. The Borneo rainforest is nearly gone and rainforests globally cover less than half of their former area all over the world. <sighs> Flying insects biomass has plummeted by as much as 80% in some places. Have you noticed that there is le less bug splatter on the windshield than when you were a child? It isn't your imagination. This should be alarming. Whatever the trend in global temperatures, insects are crucial into at, to every terrestrial food web. The insect die-off means the planet is becoming less alive. I'll say, hi guys. Thanks for joining. I haven't done that. Hi, Cindy. Okay. Hi, Marsha. Hi, Kim. Good. Let me, um, I'm not going to start over. It's okay. It's really okay. Who had no sound? No, it's fine. All right. So we're going to go on with this because I really, I, I do like this. Uh, none of the above can be directly attributed to climate change. Most are caused by land use changes and resource extraction. Forests have been clear cut. Mangrove swamps have been drained for development. Coral reefs have been blasted, bottom trawled, and suffocated by sediment released by soil erosion and deforestation. Climate change may be an exacerbating factor, but it is not the primary cause. 
The reefs, for example, suffered catastrophic losses before bleaching was widespread. In the case of the insect holocaust, we also must consider the ongoing 90-year experiment we have performed by regularly dousing vast areas of land with insecticide. Tell me this isn't a really good article. It would be nice to attribute all ecological problems to one single quantifiable cause, greenhouse gases. Then to be green, all you have to do is use solar power and offset your emissions, right? Then collectively, all we need to do is save the planet, is to switch to carbon neutral energy sources. Certainly that would be technically challenging, but in principle, it wouldn't require a fundamental shift in the course of development or humanity's relationship to the planet. Over the last 20 years, practically every environmental issue has either been hitched to the climate change wagon or relegated to secondary status. Issues like offshore oil drilling, which is what we were talking about with our lovely two um, best friend buddy oligarchs, uh, da, 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 da. I don't want to lose my places. Okay. Oh, okay. So, um, oh, blah, blah, blah. relegated to secondary statuses. Issues like offshore oil drilling or forest conservation used to be about preserving the forests we love and preventing oil spills. Now it is, we have to stop drilling and clear cutting because climate change. Meanwhile, Causes like plastic in the oceans or elephant conservations, conservation, which have little obvious relevance to climate change, become boutique issues. Since after all, what do they matter compared to the momentous goal of saving the world? For at least 20 years we've been saying, stop the pipeline because it'll contribute to global warming. Stop the tar sands excavation because it will contribute to global warming. Stop fracking because it will contribute to global warming. Implement soil conservation measures because exposed soil organic matter um, oxidizes into CO2 and it contributes to global warming and so on. If it becomes apparent that global warming isn't happening, or even if one can plausibly argue it isn't happening, then though these issues lose their grounding. Environmentalists might come to regret tethering so many issues onto climate change. They might regret building the equation green equals low carbon. Now I'm going somewhere with this, don't get upset. <laughs> the skeptic web websites I scan do not hesitate to use any sign of global cooling to discredit environmentalism generally. Their skepticism about global warming accompanies skepticism about biodiversity, toxic waste, plastic in the oceans, and virtually every other environmental issue. With a few notable exceptions, their message is basically, everything is fine. Those enviros and greenies, they hate progress, and they are concocting issues like global warming as a way to implement their agenda of a totalitarian socialist world government. In most polarized debates, evolutionary truths are revealed by questioning the tacit agreements that both sides share. In this case, both sides agree to stage the fight on the matters of greenhouse gases and temperature. This agreement sucks the oxygen out of the room for any other issue. It also usurps the other non-climate reasons for opposing things like fracking or pipelines, reasons that do not require adherence to a highly politicized and hard to prove scientific theory. It's not, but I like, I'm going, I digress, let's go on. At one point, I realized that every practice that, that one might oppose on climate grounds, I oppose for other reasons too. Pipelines leak, oil and gas, tar sands evacuation destroys entire landscapes, fracking contaminates groundwater, coal burning emits harmful pollutants, offshore drilling creates horrible oil spills. Horrible. Even if global warming were a hoax, I would want to contail them all in a way the skeptics are right about me. I do have, and he he's, says, I do have an ulterior agenda. It isn't to implement a totalitarian one world government, sorry. It is to change fundamentally the human relationship to the rest of life. It is to consider in conducting any human activity how we affect the beings and places where we act. 
In testing na Navy sonar, it asks, how will this affect the whales? In building a pipeline, it asks, how will this endanger the river? In mining for gold in the Amazon, it asks, how will this affect the forest and the people indigenous to it? In developing new pesticides, it asks, how will this affect the soil, the earthworm, the birds, the insects, the river, the estuary, the bay and the ocean? Aren't we all concerned about this? Another article I read today describes efforts to save seabirds on the remote Lord Howe Island in the South Pacific. Marine biologists are there performing leverage, uh, oh, lavage on the chicks to wash plastic from their stomachs, often hundreds of pieces of it. That is preventing them from absorbing nutrition. The chicks are starving. I can think of no convincing argument that these painstaking efforts will mitigate climate change or bring any quantifiable benefit to humanity. But looking at the video of the tender rescue effort, I couldn't help but feel grateful to the biologists. It seemed obvious to me that they are rendering Earth and humanity an important service. Who can say through what mysterious causal pathways their work will bear its impact? And who can say how the morphic field of care they stand in will propagate? The skeptics accuse environmentalists of caring more about seabirds, whales, and spotted owls than people. It may sound here that I too care more about the seabirds than, than about the economic benefits of cheap plastic, that I care more about the soil, the earthworms, the birds, the insects, the rivers, the estuary, the bay, and the ocean than I do about human beings, that I would sacrifice jobs, sacrifice benefits of modernity, and even sacrifice human lives for the sake of the environment. Voicing this critique, the Japanese skeptic Kunihiko Takeda says global warming is a hoax by those who want to keep developing nations walking barefoot. What he means is that if we stop expanding the use of fossil fuels, development will halt and the benefits of modernity will be lost to the world. In the end, this objection can only stand in the mindset of separation that sees human well-being as separable from all beings. The story of separation says, what happens to nature need not affect ourselves. I subscribe to a story which says the contrary, that self and other, human and nature, inner and outer are not really separate, that everything that happens to the world happens in some manner to ourselves as well that with every extinction, something dies in all of us. That with loss of biodiversity comes cultural and spiritual poverty, that ex environmental pollution inevitably coincides with the spread of moral, mental, physical, social, and spiritual poisons. Besides, are we really benefiting from all that plastic? Are we happier that our than our grandparents for having plastic bags rather than cloth, plastic bottles rather than refillable glass, plastic drinking straws rather than paper? For that matter, is it so bad to walk barefoot? I do all the time outside. It's called grounding or earthing. Is it so bad to be without cars, cheap air travel, broadband, air conditioning, abundant consumer goods, convenience foods, and cheap throwaway stuff? In the context of the current society built around these things, it is hard to be without them. If we take cars for granted, it is progress to have a nicer one. If we take roads for granted, it is progress to have a wider one. If we rely on digital communication devices, it is progress to have a faster one. The houses are built for air conditioning. The towns are built for cars. The pressures of life demand conveniences and time-saving technology. Exercising, sorry, exercising different, sorry, sorry, baby. Different choices as an individual consumer is not the whole answer. We need to explore forms of development and economy in which humans thrive without extracting more and more from the wild. 
The specter of global warming asks us to rethink the direction of civilization and the human relationship to the earth. No wonder many people want to deny it's happening. My point here, Actually, my plea is that whether or not it's happening, let us rethink the direction of civilization. Let us change our relationship to the earth. Let's explore a different concept, conception of wealth, measured in relationships, not products, participation, and not extracting. My fear is that a cooling trend will abort that inquiry. My fear is that will it will quell what the idea of climate change has awakened. The disturbing realization of the mutual dependency of human and trees and the whales is our wealth too. It may not be the kind of wealth visible in GDP, gross domestic product statistics. It may not register as an increase in kilowatt hours of power consumed per capita or miles driven or megabytes downloaded or any of the things we normally measure or count. I think we already have had enough of the quantifiable, although it is poorly distributed, a separate though deeply related issue. What we need more of are the things that are hard to quantify. The rising tide of suicide and depression in the developed world is not caused by shrinking residential floor space or lack of access to 4G cell service. It probably has something to do with the, the disintegration of community, the widening of, of, of connection, the loss of purpose and meaning, chronic pain and unresolved trauma, unprocessed grief, ambient anxiety, and the other accoutrements of separation. This point seems obvious here at my brother's farm where I write this because my life is rich here, rich in relationship to the natural world through my hands, my senses, my labor, and yes, my bare feet and rich in relation to the human world, as well through shared labor, common purpose, and mutual reliance. And the point seems equally unobvious when I'm separated from all these things. In the busy world of cars and clocks and screens, faster and more of them seems like progress. The richness of life around me enriches my own experience of life. I could have written this myself. This is the realization of non-separation. It is also the fundamental realization of ecology. In my book research, I confirmed again and again that climate science has over the years consistently understated the effect of biology on climate. While the appreciation of carbon sequestration by forests and other ecosystems has grown, a covert geochemical bias holds sway. Seeing life as, as a hostage to random or man-made fluctuations in atmosphere components. A rival view, which I call the living planet view, holds that fundamentally it is life itself that maintains the conditions for life. Accordingly, the depletion of life is the biggest threat to the climate and the biosphere generally. Unless we stop degrading the ecosystems, clear-cutting the forests, draining the wetlands, decimating the fish and land vertebrates, and dousing the land with insecticides, that even if we cut carbon emissions to zero, the planet will still die a death of a million cuts. There is indeed a horrifying crisis underway, and cooling will not signify that it has abated. In the last 10 years, science has gained a new appreciation of the ways living things and systems affect temperature, weather, and climate. Whales transport nutrients from the depths to the surface and from nutrient-rich feeding grounds to nutrient-poor birthing areas, allowing life to thrive there and ultimately affecting carbon sequestration. Ice nuclear, nucleating bacteria stimulate the formation of clouds that reflect sunlight, and, and bring rain, where otherwise there would be heat trapping haze and so-called humid drought. Forests generate a biotic pump that draws moisture laden air from the oceans to the interiors. Their destruction causes many of the droughts blamed on climate change. Healthy soils, grasslands and wetlands absorb water that would otherwise run off, buffering against flooding, also blamed on climate change and recharging aquifers that feed springs that nourish, nourish life through the dry season. 
A healthy climate comes from a healthy biosphere. Gauging health by temperature alone obscures the truth. In the living planet view, no longer can we cut down a virgin forest here and offset the carbon with a tree farm there. No longer can we dam the Niger, thereby destroying vast wetlands while assuring ourselves that the planet will benefit from the climate-friendly electricity. No longer can we convert the Carolina forests to wood chipping plantations again for climate friendly electricity. No longer can we blithely assume that some ecosystems or species are expendable. Why? Because they are organs and tissues of a living earth. Will the planet warm or cool? I have no idea. Over my years of book research, I became less confident, not more, of the inevitability of greenhouse gas-induced warming. Slowly, cracks are spreading in the dominant narrative. We could very well see cooling or warming or even both, worsening gyrations like a top spitting out, like an animal with organ failure that can no longer regulate its body temperature. Wild fluctuations in temperature and precipitation are inevitable as the living systems that maintain homeostasis loses their vitality. Regardless of whether the planet warms or cools, the things we need to do to maintain ecological health are the same. The key words are conservation, protection, regeneration, and repair. Conserving forests, stopping pipelines, repairing ecosystems, regenerating agricultural soils, and so on will, as a side effect, reduce greenhouse emissions and increase biotic carbon uptake. But they do not rely on that result for their motivation. The motivation is to serve the flourishing of life, biological and human. This commitment should not depend on the trend in global temperature. I loved it. Now, I am a climate change advocate of, you know, I know it's happening. He knows it's happening. But he's talking about the beauty of the world, of the planet, of our earth, of our mother who we are hurting. And as we segue to the beginning of this, of what I was talking about between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, two oligarchs that don't give any thought to any of this. Donald Trump's actions throughout his presidency have shown us he doesn't care about the, at, uh, the atmosphere, the ecosphere. He doesn't care. That is why I was upset. And neither does Vladimir Putin. So there you go, I made a full circle this week on this show. And I really thank you. I really thank you for coming. Margo's here, hi Margo. I, I wanna say hi to Frank, hi Frank. I've kept you guys long enough. Kim said we've had so many fires here last week and it's all, it's all um, smoggy in, in Washington. See, these are the things that are happening. They are happening from climate change. They are happening from a warming of our atmosphere. Margo, go to Margo's Healing Corner and watch her videos. I share them. She will explain what's happening with the ozone and the methane. She will explain it. And then she has a call every two weeks. Carolyn Baker has a safe circle call. Things are starting to happen for the people like me, all of us that really care about the earth and that really see that bigger picture that can step away from the everyday mindless arguing and screaming and yelling. And that's what we have to do. Namaste, I need to go put my neck brace on. Thank you for coming.